Medical education is an evolving field that requires timely intervention. It gives me great pleasure to warmly invite all of you present here today and those of you joining us online to witness the launch of books authored by our fellow colleagues and experts catering to the timely needs. Before we commence the formal proceedings for this evening, may I kindly request all of you to rise for the national anthem. Keeping in line with tradition and culture of Sri Lanka, may I kindly invite the following dignitaries to mark the commencement of the ceremony by lighting the oil lamp. Our chief guest this evening, Dr. Palita Abekun, guest of honor, Professor Surangi Yasavardhana, Professor Ishan Disoiza, the secretary of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor Indika Karnatelaka, professor in medical education at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, Dr. Sajid Edrisingha, Senior Lecturer in Anatomy and Clinical Genetics at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Sri Jayavadanapura, representing doctors, Dr. Chandana Atapattu, and a representative of the medical students.
Thank you. May I kindly request the following dignitaries to grace us at the head table. Our chief guest this evening, Dr. Palita Abekon, guest of honor, Professor Surangi Yasavardhana, Professor Indika Karuna Tilaka, and Dr. Sajit Edrisingha. Once again, a very good evening to all of you and a warm welcome to this very special occasion. So firstly, let me kindly invite the chairperson of the Sri Lanka Medical Association Expert Committee on uh, Medical Education, Professor Indika Karunathilaka, to deliver the opening remarks on this special occasion. Dr. Palita Bacon, our chief guest this evening, past president of SLME and WHO special envoy to the director general and also on medical education. Professor Surangiya Swardhana, our guest of honor, member of Sri Lanka Medical Council, as well as former dean of the faculty of medicine, University of Shijawardhana. Dr. Shandi Soisa, Professor Ishan Soisa, honorary secretary, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Dr. Sajit Ediri Singha, co-author of the book on anatomy that will be launched today. All the participants joining in person as well as online. Very good evening to all of you. On behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Edu Edu Association Expert Committee on Medical Education, I welcome all of you for this very special occasion, the inaugural seminar on medical education by the Medical Education Committee, as well as the book launch. And I thank all of you for braving the conditions during a difficult time period like that for joining in person, as well as online, because even joining online is a challenging thing during these circumstances. Some might wonder why we want to have an event like this during a time period like a crisis time period. Why are we talking about medical education? Why we want to talk about medical education? Why we want to make a book launch in a situation like this? It's a very reason because medical education is affected by the current crisis situation. It will be affected more severely, perhaps. And not only by the outcome or the impact of the crisis situation, but perhaps even by the solutions that are brought in. Therefore, it's very important for us to be very familiar and very sound about the principles of medical education, how this journey of medical education has taken place, and the basics. Because that would help, that could help an informed discussion and informed dialogue. That's the very reason that we wanted to have this event at this very moment. So once again, I thank all of you for joining this very special occasion. And we hope that this could be a start of, a, of an informed dialogue related to medical education in Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I warmly welcome our chief guest this evening, who is no stranger to the field of medical education, a fellow Sri Lankan whom we are very proud of, Dr. Palita Abeko, a past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, WHO consultant for medical education and head of the accreditation unit at the Sri Lanka Medical Council to address the gathering. Thank you very much. Professor Surangi, Professor Indika, Dr. Sajita Dirsinga, and all the distinguished colleagues who are sitting in this uh, auditorium and also all those who are following these proceedings online. 
Uh, good, good afternoon or good evening to you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Professor Indika for this kind invitation to, to attend this function. Uh, when he's very important, uh, I think, uh, uh, technical production that he has labored over. I don't know whether he labored over, but I know he spent a lot of time with reading and pre pre in preparation, uh, which I think got delayed in coming out because of these circumstances under which we have been through the last few months. But nevertheless, I'm so happy that uh, you are doing it today and it will be a great asset to everyone interested in medical education in our country. Uh, I am particularly happy to be here uh, because uh, uh, Professor Indica, or Indica as I call him, and, uh, and I go a long way back. Not only do we hail from the same uh, geographical uh, territory in this country, we are quite neighborly in that way, but more than that, he and I have not only a very strong personal relationship, we have had a very strong professional relationship. Uh, Professor Indika was the vice president in 2014 and 15 when I was the president of the SLME, and uh, he and uh, Dr. Ruiz, Professor Ruiz Hanifa, they were the two vice presidents, who actually did most of the work during that year in the SLME, which meant that I had to do very little or nothing. And I have acknowledged this then, I acknowledge it now. And Indica particularly was the person who ran our annual sessions almost in its entirety, getting it organized. So Indica, this may be another good occasion to, to remember that and to say thank you very much. The other reason I, I'm happy is that uh, I have had the pleasure and privilege, he gave me an advanced copy. In fact, he asked me to write a forward also for it, which I did very happily. But when I read it, I found that it was very contemporary, traces the history of medical education, and then also related to the contemporary issues and the issues that we are likely to face in the future. So I think in that way, uh, the title of the, the book is also very appropriate. It is a journey, a journey that's not complete, journey where we don't know, but journey that is still very much work in progress. I will not take too much time, but I think it's an opportunity at a time like this when we are talking of medical education and the, the significance of this to us in Sri Lanka, just remind ourselves of two, three stories that uh, I like to share with uh, people like you who are enlightened uh, medical educators. Uh, see, first point I want to make is that medical education per se, uh, per se has very little mean meaning. Medical education becomes relevant only in terms of what the service requirements are. The two, it's like the left hand, right hand. Medical education per se does not mean much. Health services cannot be run without good medical education. So that prism, I think we need to always bear in mind often because of our sophistication, we tend to forget it. One goes in one direction, the other tends to. So the two should not get dissociated. And I think Professor Indika makes that point very strongly in his book, which is very, very important for all of us to remember at all time. This has been the history. It has been always like that. The training of doctors ultimately is for the provision of services to the individuals and the community. Second point I want to make is that Sri Lanka historically has had good quality medical education. When I say good quality, certainly good technical quality medical education. And uh, I can cite very quickly two stories to, to illustrate this from then and now. About uh, 10 years ago, yeah, maybe about 10 years, I, when I was in the WHO, I was at a meeting in New Mexico City. And uh, there I met a gentleman, very distinguished looking tall gentleman with a fist cap, which means that he's, uh, from, he's a Jewish person. Uh, he was sitting next to me to take the trolley, the, the shuttle bus to the city, and they asked me where I am from. It was the same meeting, it was on medical education. I said, uh, I am from Sri Lanka. That was Sri Lanka then. Then he immediately asked me, isn't that the old Ceylon? I said, yes, yes. I said, how do you know? He said, and this is very significant. He said, you know, I was the chief of medicine at the famous Coney Island Hospital in New York for many years. And the best interns I had in my hospital, in our unit, were Sri Lankan, trained in, trained in Ceylon. Uh, 
he prattled off a list of names of the doctors. Some of them are my contemporaries. And they said, after that, not only I, most of the doctors in that hospital, the consultants, always look for Sri Lankan doctors to have their sign. That's the first part. That's, let's say, 50 years ago. Then, about 15, 20 years ago, I was at the WHO at the executive board meeting with our then minister. And that was a time, uh, Dr. Ishan, when there was a little problem of getting doctors training slots in England because the, the Europeans were coming, et cetera, et cetera. So I, in the executive board, since our uh, country's name starts with S, next to that, 32 people, no, next to that was UK, United Kingdom. So minister, well, the, the, the chief medical officer of UK was sitting there, a guy by the name of Dr. Ian uh, Donaldson. He was CMO of England. And we were talking about this issue that we had. And I uh, told Dr. Donaldson, we have this issue. Uh, he said, oh, I didn't know that. I mean, it doesn't come to his level, though. I said, uh, we have this problem, uh, can you, we didn't expect anything serious, but nevertheless, we thought it's good to bring, bring to his notice. He what, he, what happened later is different, but no, not different, it's, it's uh, slightly different what we expected. But nevertheless, he said, my God, Sri, Sri Lankan doctors, we have great respect for Sri Lankan medical education. He said, I'll personally go and look into it. Things change. I mean, his input may have been limited, but nevertheless, the circumstances change also and made it easier for our doctors, you know, people like you to go and get your OCs, whatever attachments, etc. So that's, again, res, uh, recognition of the quality of medical education of Sri Lanka. Recently, just two weeks ago, and this, I think you are involved in this, uh, Professor Rina Chandrasekhar told me they had this specialist exam for, for surgery specialization in urology, and they had this, uh, the Royal College of uh, Surgeons were coming here as observers to see what was going on just two weeks ago. And they had been amazed at the quality of the, the candidates who came there. They had been amazed at the technical competence and the quality of these doctors who came there. So I'm saying over, a, at least to my knowledge, over a period of 60, 70 years, our quality of our medical education in terms of our doctor's skills and competencies and their knowledge has been world-class. That I think is, is, is a fact that we have enough evidence for. I refer to some of the things that we need to fill up there because I think we need to fill up some of the soft skills as a technologically uh, as, as we get technological advance and more and more competence in in terms of skills and technical competence sometimes as a, in a relative way we may forget to strengthen ourselves with the technical the, the soft skills which are necessary and I think medical education in Sri Lanka, as well as in most of the developed countries, which sometimes is worse there, have to bear that in mind. And that's a gap we need to fill. So we need to revisit medical education, at least for a number of uh, reasons. One of which you mentioned, Provindika, uh, the experience we gained from the corona. Where globally, I mean, it, it was unintentional in way, nevertheless, it was, it, it was forced on us. Education became hybrid, remote. Many things which we are doing face to face had to be through necessity to be done in different ways. Online teaching, online, et cetera, et cetera, around the world. And uh, I think in most places, they managed to handle it, develop it quite successfully. But online learning, there is a limitation. Particularly for the clinical sciences, patient care, there is a limitation. You can, people still do online learning to uh, develop clinical skills, but ultimately medicine is an intensely personal encounter between a doctor and a patient, the community and a doctor. And somehow there are limitations. It's not, it's not possible to fill 100% of that requirement by online learning. So there is always this necessity to do that. But many countries are now trying to do, uh, develop different types of technologies to do that. But I hope it doesn't go to that stage. I hope it will remain a personal encounter where actually we spend time with patients and in the wards and in the community. The, I'll, I'll not talk very much more. I mean, there's much we can talk about, but we are going to listen to some of the other experts who are here. The other issue I think we need to, I'm saying the things which are not commonly thought of is economics, the economics of medical education. But money will be short. The technology will be very high. So we will have to find ways of not only economizing on the process of medical education, but within that, 
in the health services, we'll have to teach our, our, our young doctors who are coming out, not only the technical competence and, and the skills that they need, but also how to think of the economics of healthcare. Because it's going to be more and more expensive, particularly countries like ours and most of you know, with commun communicable diseases, you know, getting getting to a certain extent taken care of. Of course, they all keep pandemics will keep coming. That, that's irrespective of what we do. But nevertheless, relative to that, non-communicable diseases will be predominating uh, in in our in our disease burden for a considerable time to come. And non-communicable NCDs, as we call them, uh, we used to say in the WHO those days. NC, the, those days we were not sure whether it will be this expensive to manage NCDs. We say NCDs are those diseases which ultimately will break the bank. It's going to be so expensive and there is no end to it. So we have to always think of the economics of it and our doctors have to see, find ways of how do we reduce the cost to the government, which is ultimately cost to all of us, and also cost to the patients as they go. This is another aspect that you might have to pay a little bit more emphasis if you're not doing so already. I think I'll, I will stop there. Now, one more other thing I want to tell you since I have this opportunity. The other thing relates to what you all have been doing, this question of your integrated patient care management that you have. I think that is one aspect of what I think we should also be looking at. The new healthcare reorientation that's going on in the country calls for a lot of family practitioner, general practitioner types of skills. Now in England, for example, the, the cornerstone of the medical service in the National Health Service is a general practitioner. And the consultants are the, I, the people who do the more serious, uh, when I say serious, more difficult or the technologically difficult work, but everyone comes through the system, through the National Health Service, through general practice. We are not going to have that at that, but even at the primary care level, I think some of our doctors need to develop some of these family practice uh, skills and competencies and attitudes. And that I think is the expectation of this World Bank project that is going on. So there are a number of things that you need to add. Your book identifies many of them. Uh, once again, congratulations on, uh, on this production. And I also want to mention before I finish, Sajit uh, Singh, you all be interested in this subject and uh, what at a young age you got into this and you're doing this. I think it's a great thing. And it's uh, that's I'd say now, I belong to the first generation or wave of medical education in Sri Lanka. The guys who were, got to get uh, as a profession. Indika, if I'm right, and his contemporaries belong to the second generation of medical educationists who came out in, a, in, a, in our system. And of course, what we had at our time, one medical school in the country has three, four times a number in terms of number. And I think the third generation, I can see them behind us, Therefore, I think medical education as science, as a technological process, is in very good hands. So I wish you all the best. And thank you very much once again for inviting me. Bye. Thank you, sir. It was very enlightening. And definitely equal focus on soft skills is indeed a need of the hour.